You're just saying you're going to do it. So he, he told Bill Allen, I could drop a lot of engineers. His job was on the line, unless he cut a thousand engineers, almost a quarter of his workforce. I know that. So here I am in front of Bill Allen and all my management people telling them, hey, uh, this is the real facts of life. We can't give up any, any engineers. I'll leave it with you guys. Sutter refused to back down. I figured that was my last day at Boeing. But he won the standoff. Boeing had little option but to continue with the project. If we had dumped a thousand engineers, the program would have collapsed. Then what would you do? <laughs> Throw it out the window and declare bankruptcy? Now it was touch and go if Boeing would go bust before the 747 was ready. And the big press launch date was fast approaching. Today, the first 747 prototype sits at the Seattle Museum of Flight. With peeling paint, RA-001 is a shadow of its former self as the museum struggles to raise funds to restore it. This is the number one airplane that was designed never to go into uh, airline service. It was designed as sort of a development airplane. We did a lot of interesting engineering work on this thing to, to get the airplane tuned up. The prototype still has some of the water barrels used to simulate payloads during tests. Banks of equipment that could measure how the airframe and engines would perform under the stress of flight. But 45 years ago, this museum exhibit was a hive of activity. Sutter and his team raced to get the prototype ready to show to the world's press. Well, the media were all excited because here was a new airplane which hadn't happened for a while. But there were more parts on the floor than in the airplane. We were still designing and testing the airplane, and uh, we didn't get an airplane put together until two days before we rolled it out. With paint still wet and parts missing, the prototype was rolled out to an expectant press and public. But for Bill Allen, it was a relief just to have something to show Pan Am and the nervous bankers. It was also time to reassure the 25 other airlines who'd placed orders that this was the aircraft sensation of the decade. Rollout day came to us as uh, real excitement. It was pure adrenaline as far as I was concerned. TV cameras were there, everything was rolling. We were all invited along to stand outside and watch this magnificent thing come out of the hangar. And I think the it gave everybody a thrill. I can't imagine anybody who didn't feel, you know, pretty proud of that day. 26 air hostesses prepared for the christening. It didn't quite go to plan. So don't break it yet. The cadence is gonna be one, two, three. Got it? <laughs> okay, wait, wait. Do it again. One, two, three. But behind the excitement, there was one thing that Boeing didn't shout about. The aircraft couldn't fly. The engines were purely decorative. Yeah, when they rolled it out, it was very dramatic gargantuan airplane with this great promise of hauling so many people so far and a great promise of, of changing aviation. Uh, the question was, was that promise going to be realized or not? So while we enjoyed the day, uh, I think we realized that it was uh, eyes down and start working as soon as all of the, uh, the publicity had gone away. Sutter and his team had just 54 days before the prototype was scheduled for its first flight and they had a major crisis on their hands with the engines. Up to now, 
No commercial engine had sufficient power to lift even half the weight of a 747. But manufacturers Pratt & Whitney had developed a new, untested engine that could. The JT-9D was a high-bypass turbofan, an entirely new concept. It promised good fuel efficiency, low noise, and above all, phenomenal thrust. It's fundamentally like a jet engine that drives a big fan at the front. The secret of its design was a massive eight-foot fan on the front. This drew air not only into the central turbine, but also bypassed more than five times as much around the outside. The bypassing air added an incredible 70% extra thrust. And there was another bonus. At the back, the roar from the exhaust of the inner turbine was enveloped and softened by the bypassing air. Pratt & Whitney promised to make the 747 quieter than jets half the size, yet two and a half times as powerful. Everything depended on its success. But in tests, it seemed they had promised too much. What you'd see, first of all, is the whole thing shake. At the same time, you'd hear a very big bang. Sometimes the flames are longer than the airplane. And, uh, of course, when that happens, you burn up things like turbine blades. No one could work out what the fault was. During the 747's development, a total of 60 multi-million dollar engines were written off. But Boeing couldn't wait any longer. They had to prove to the world that the 747 could fly. Two months behind schedule, Test pilot Jack Waddell and his crew walked out to the prototype. It was time for the 747's first flight. Waddell's co-pilot was Brian Weigel. It was an incredible day. You have to realize there was this enormous pressure from all over the world. This thing had drawn the attention of, of the aviation industry over the globe. And there was a huge mob watching it. Bill Allen was a risk taker. He was literally betting Boeing on this airplane. And there was a lot of nervousness about this. There, there were a lot of people saying that it wasn't gonna fly. So there was a lot of pressure to make this happen. Test pilot Jack Waddell and his crew deliberately wore their everyday clothes as they entered the flight deck. There was so much skepticism about the 747. Put this thing really work? Is it way too big? And you know, will it even fly? And so on. So I think Jack's concept was to make it a an everyday occurrence kind of thing. This airplane's safe. Look at us. We're just dressed here in our normal suits and ties. But despite outward appearances, Jack Waddell was worried about the engines. Tight. Double check. On the first flight. Jack Waddell was concerned enough. We actually put in about 40 automobile batteries, hooked them up to hydraulic pumps, so in case he lost all four engines, he'd have flight controls. At around 11.20 a.m., RA-001 headed off for the runway. It was time. RA-001, roger that. All the lights were green, <laughs> so we taxied out to the runway and, of course, checked all the engines. The aircraft was empty, except for the two pilots and flight engineer. It was too dangerous to risk more lives. In that period of uh, history, you didn't have simulators to prepare you for the airplane flying. Nobody knew for sure how the 747 would behave. Now was the moment of truth. Zero one, roger that. J-1 
Jack pulled back, the nose came up, wheels left the ground. The engines were all running. <laughs> At that moment, we had a great feeling of relief. Now, now we can go about our work, you know. It was a glorious feeling. The only thing I can compare it to is the birth of your first child. I mean, just, it is cool. It's great stuff. The vision of that airplane, as big as it was, lifting off for the first time, was just magic. And away it went, and it overflew the airfield. And I think, you know, every, the hair on every back of everybody's neck was standing up, certainly was on mine. It's a very uh, easily flyable airplane. Still in the takeoff configuration. We haven't tried to change anything yet. Everything uh, looks very normal on the right side, Jack. And I'll go ahead and check the left. Beautiful. We also knew the press was listening to everything we said as well, so we weren't going to say anything bad in any case. But it was, it was a, a, a great feeling. All went well until Waddell tried out the flaps on the wings. We were retracting the flaps, and there was a distinctive clunk sound when it happened. One of the flaps that slows the aircraft for landing had come loose. There was a danger it might have come off. Jack decided that we shouldn't venture any further, and uh, we didn't want something more serious to happen. Now, with greater speed than planned, came the dangerous part, landing 300 tons of aircraft. Many, many people again said, okay, she'll take off and fly, but how do you get that big thing under the ground, especially with a pilot sitting 35 feet in the air at touchdown? Of course, I was waiting for that landing and get rid of this last concern. Then when it came in for landing, of course, since you're looking down the runway at it, it really looks slow. I kept thinking to myself, you're too slow, you're too slow, you're too slow. He made a nice approach, and he looked pretty confident. And, uh, of course, I'm sitting there relaxed, and uh, Jack has to make a good landing in front of all those people. Waddell landed the first time, he had no problem at all. And uh, the airplane proved that it was a good flying machine on that first flight. The feeling of completion, actually, once you slow down and start to taxi, you feel you're pretty well completed. And that huge mob awaiting, but the fact that this had come off after all these, this time was a, was a great feeling of superb satisfaction. The Boeing team had worked miracles, turning sketches on paper into the largest commercial airliner ever built, and all in record time. I guess this sounds complacent or something, but that ab thing is just ridiculously easy to fly. It's just a pilot's dream. The 747 could fly, and the engines did not explode, at least this time. But now they had to prove to the aviation authorities that the plane was safe enough for passengers. No matter how bad the weather, the tests began. They had just 11 months left. Taking the aircraft to the maximum speed before it took off, the brakes were slammed on. The wheels caught fire, but the crew had to wait an anxious five minutes before putting them out. Waddell deliberately put the 747 into death division.